Okay. Okay, it's my my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webinar. A big thank you to everyone registering and attending. We know how busy people are, so we're working hard to keep these events interesting and on target. We do encourage questions, so please use the question and chat tools in your webinar console. I'll be monitoring, collecting them for a question and answer discussion afterwards. But one housekeeping item, and I think we pretty well alleviated this. Uh, if you are dialing in on your phone, please mute your microphone on your computer. We have we've had some background noise on occasion in the past, and uh, we think that that uh, is what what caused it. A little bit about our speaker. Min Bassett began developing his insights about creative thinking and problem solving at Procter & Gamble more than 30 years ago. While at P&G, he received three U.S. patents and created a corporate-wide internal consulting practice. Following his award-winning doctoral research at the University of Cincinnati, Min became a professor of management in the Michael G. DeGroote School of Business at McMaster University. He continues to teach in the executive education program for Alto University and teaches a course on innovative and creative problem solving at the Conference Board of Canada's Directors College. His first book, The Power of Innovation, became an instant CEO need to read. He founded Bassett Applied Creativity in 1981 and has since traveled the world applying and teaching complexity thinking to many of the world's Fortune 500 companies. Today's webinar is our second webinar in a new series we are calling Advanced Topics, where we show how complexity thinking can be applied to different complex strategic problems to get creative and innovative results. Our topic today is focused on continuous improvement, the application of complexity thinking to Lean and Six Sigma, something we've coined CI squared, continuously improving, continuous improvement. Now I'm going to turn it over to Min, where he'll share some insights and examples from the field to show you how you can turbocharge your continuous improvement program. Over to you, Min. Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for being interested in our work, and uh, we'll do the best we can to get a lot of good uh, information in in a uh, in our short period of time. And um, the takeaways for today, um, looking at um, the current situation, there are limitations to Lean and Six Sigma. Even those are great things, and um, we'd like to introduce the uh, CI squared, as Bob said. Key point, this is a process and not a collection of tools. Tools fit the process, but they don't drive the process. The process is the simplexity change-making uh, process, and uh, that's the focus that we have. We're going to give you two examples uh, we've selected where continuous improvement was dri driven by simplexity and got some dramatic uh, improvements. And then we're going to look at the learnings we learned uh, and gained from these examples and uh, we talk about turbocharging a CI. It's not replacing a CI program. It is turbocharging it. So let's go ahead. Uh, t we've been using continuous improvement in uh, the North America, I, I think, has been uh, uh, used longer than that in places like Japan. But the last 20 years, and its focus has been improving quality and efficiency. And customers are pushing, pushing uh, forever. Now there's competition from other countries to do things better and faster and cheaper and uh, people are saying we'll give you the business uh, but you better um, lower the cost again 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 uh, the low-hanging fruits been picked and it's hard to keep up with this uh, increasing demand and uh, we know that often an organization will have one tool uh, we're a Six Sigma place or we're a lean place and uh, they worry too much about which one am I going to use rather than saying what's the problem we're going to be trying to solve, which opens up everything. Also, uh, we should be uh, doing the best we can to, to what's the bottom line for our projects. How do they connect? And strategically, how do they connect in the whole organization? Bottom line, how do we, how do we inject innovation into continuous improvement? Now, most of you will be familiar with this, and some of you are not. Uh, there are ways to do that, but we're talking about a process for making valuable change. This is not a tool. It's a process. And as you know, uh, there's four stages, the generation of new possibilities, the conceptualization of the possibility, optimization of a solution, and the implementation. And uh, each of them have different parts, excuse me, on the eight-step uh, uh, wheel. We call it a wheel. And uh, each of us, now generation is looking for good problems to solve. 
getting fact finding to understand and then problem definition to really understand the problem, conceptualize it and pick a tool or two or three and then optimize the program, the tool, the solution and then make sure it happens. Gain acceptance. Make sure you try it. Do it. If it doesn't work as well as it should, go around the wheel again. But it's a complete process. And as you recall, most of you will know, and you can uh, find out more if you like, people who like different parts of the process are called generators, conceptualizers, optimizers, and implementers. New problems and challenges. Some people love them. Conceptualizers really are not satisfied till they understand the problem thoroughly. Optimizers are bound and determined to get a good practical solution. And finally, implementers are going to do what it takes to get action and results. Remember now, all of us are blends, but those are the extremes. Why are we tool driven is the question. This is our research on 30,000 people globally, people like ourselves, people who work in organizations, our professionals, the vast majority are implementers and optimizers. And uh, you can speculate why, but most of us are in that direction. And the smaller part, generators and conceptualizers, is over here. And we need a balanced approach. And when we're just looking for the quickest tool, we're over, we're falling into the left-hand side. Um, you can speculate why. The way we're rewarded when we work, the way we're taught in school, the one right answer uh, syndrome, but this is really what we look like. Now, this is a symposium of 200 Lean Six Sigma people that I was at, and this is the, they uh, filled out the profile, and this is how they looked. And as you can see, there's a great preponderance on the implementation and optimization side. And if you look at this, and people here are in charge of making change, it's likely the kind of changes we're going to be making are going to be most often incremental ones on the left-hand side, not on the right-hand side, where we could be making bigger changes if we were more open to problem definition. Here is another one. This is a real live major high-tech company. I can't tell you who, but you can think of at least some. And they're so worried about making what they've got right now a little bit better, a little bit better. Their competition has a way to inroad by hopping over the right-hand side and coming up with big changes. Both are needed. This, by review, is one of the best um, pieces of information that you can build on that I've come across. Uh, this is Paul, Potts, Paul Mott's uh, model. Effective organizations, they know how to quickly react. This is flexibility. Something new happens, never seen before, bango, they are able to react quickly with and often turn a crisis into a challenge, opportunity. Efficiency, this means Organizations who are polishing their routines, trying to hit 100%, higher quantity, higher quality, lower cost, relentless pursuit of current procedures, not necessarily coming up with anything new, but making them better and better and better. Finally, the adaptability. Keyword here is proactive. Adaptability is not waiting for problems. It's looking for problems. It's not waiting for new technologies. It's looking for them and grabbing them quickly. It's disruptive. And uh, this is where we are today with the accelerating rate of change. This is very, very important where it might not have been so 30, 40, 50 years ago. Effective or bottom line, they do all three. And because of rapidly accelerating change, we're struggling in many organizations to increase performance in all three for competitive edge. And uh, we're trying so hard. It's so hard to do things we never did before. And uh, in the old days, change could be accidental. It could just happen. Uh, and it could be on the back burner. But nowadays, it has to be a name of the game, something you would do continuously. Uh, in many organizations, those, uh, they use tools. And uh, you can look at this list of tools. There's so many of them. And you could ask, uh, how many do we have? And uh, they get more and more complicated as time goes on. And um, we look for more and more out of them as time goes on. And we're into different kinds of lean. Way back when we were talking 5Ss, but they're all in practice. And uh, so this is looking at the tools we're talking about currently in, in continuous improvement. Now, here's some examples from the field, two very important examples where we used uh, simplexity to drive uh, 
uh, continuous improvement. The first one is the Jervinsky Cancer Center. It's in Hamilton, Ontario. It's part of the Ontario um, Cancer Care um, Network. And the, uh, uh, the situation was, let's evaluate our radiation treatment planning process. Maybe we could look at it as a way to uh, reduce wait times. And wait times were a very big deal uh, at the time. The project objectives were, at the beginning, new impact, new high impact of uh, fresh ideas to be implemented, use concrete data, and make them transferable to other healthcare institutions so they could use it as well. In summary, uh, this was given as a summary um, uh, at, the, um, at the hospital. We had 30 people representing every aspect of the, of the process, every single aspect from booking clerks, uh, clerks to uh, physicians to nurses, everybody who was involved. The group identified five bottlenecks and implemented nine improvement ideas. Planning time was reduced to 7.1 days from 10.8, 34%, and a CI program was established to ad implement additional process improvement solutions, not just do a one-off. Here's the project flow. The first stage is to formulate the problem, and this is done by making a simplified process flow chart. Very, very simplified, but complete. Identify process bottlenecks by the team, the group who starts it. Then we turn those top bottlenecks into challenges, starting with how might we? How might we get the blood to the um, blood test done faster, for example? Then we confirm the data. We go back in the field and we make sure that the how might we selected are really the right how might we's or uh, are they, maybe we were wrong, or maybe there's a better one in there, but we confirm them, and we put um, uh, metrics on uh, how quickly, and put times on them. Solution formulation, subteams are formed to create recommended solutions and milestones against each of the how might we statements that were chosen. Final solutions are chosen by the sub-teams in concert with the overall steering committee at the top. Now, we go into solution implementation. New teams are formed, partly with old and partly with new people, and their job is to make a plan and get the solutions implemented. This includes roadblock working sessions. If a solution is not working as well as it should, not being accepted, well, let's call that a fuzzy situation. Let's get at it and form a team and solve that problem. Uh, weekly action planning is done where people get together and plan how we're going to implement. And then we assess the results to see how well we did. And then we go around the wheel again if we need to make it better. Here is a simplified process flow map. And I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but you can see there are major portions to it. There's not 55 pages of stuff. It's when it's basically what we're trying to do. And uh, it starts uh, with the decision to treat. Now that's number one, look at the bottom. The patient receives the, first, uh, receives the first treatment after we go through the various steps. And number seven is book the first radiation treatment. So every one of these is a step on the way and this is developed by doing what we call a patient flow. A person comes in, we follow the patient all the way through, all the way from booking, from here to there to everywhere, and we t make a, um, a guess at what it is. And then we put this uh, up in front of the steering committee who may have never seen a complete process flow in their lives before, but there it is, and we ask them to start uh, evaluating it and people start saying well no 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 yeah this by the time we finish we will have a process flow that everybody on that team says yep that's pretty much it might not be perfect but it's pretty much it and that's when we start having them come up and start putting dots on the various parts where they think the bottlenecks are but this is the process flow the learnings we got you have to have complete involvement throughout 
when we start this going, we say, let's get the calendars out. Let's uh, plot the various stages of the process and let's commit to everybody being there. And we can't have people saying, well, I don't know if I can make it or not. Let's pick a date that we can all the way through. Critical. The process facilitation has to be independent dependent of the content, the work. Somebody has to process, flow, process the flow around the wheel and stays out of the content, moving the project forward. Group problem solving, to run it, uh, when we t run into roadblocks, we solve them. When a group gets together, we solve them. The process chart is fundamental. It's fact finding in its uh, uh, best form where we know what we're dealing with. Remember those how might we's? Sometimes the right how might we's aren't the first ones we see and they come out after some considered data collecting. The more we have quantitative metrics, the more people stay focused on what we're trying to do and we continually see where we're going and how we're doing it. Here's the second one, the Goodrich Corporation. of, um, And this was a project we did inside uh, Goodrich to understand and learn and also to execute. The idea was how do we re-energize our program? Now, the first thing is there has to be a business need and there was one at Goodrich. The CI contribution has to be supporting a really important strategic goal. In this case, a target of 5% improvement annually was part of the strategy and it was becoming more and more difficult to get to. A lot of competition uh, and more and more performance demands from being placed on suppliers like Goodrich. For example, we want you to produce the same landing gear, half of its weight, lasting three times longer, but at half the price. That becomes a challenge. Now the opportunity. Companies um, are facing these situations these days. Um, they're, we're having to move up to a higher level be, beyond the lower hanging fruit. It's really important to define problems correctly throughout the project. And you know, we are so tool driven to optimization and implementation. This is a hard thing to realize. We have something to do here that can help. We have got to make this organization wide. Uh, it's no longer just uh, one uh, place or another, customers, um, suppliers. We've got to align our problem solving with strategic goals. Now we've got to, uh, we have the opportunity to include revenue building requiring innovation if we are smart about what we do and we'll get into that. We need the appropriate tools. We got to use our re uh, resource efficiently and we've got to get implementation. This is the opportunity that was facing Goodrich at the time and many organizations are looking at the same thing. Here's the flow. The first is the pre-consult. And we're going to get into that later. In the pre-consult, before we start anything, we get together with the key people and we define the problem very, very carefully. Then we design the program, including selecting the right tools and the right people. The second stage is to go into action, actually use uh, our skills to apply the tool, whatever it might be, five S's, six Sigma, lean, to create a problem solving process then we implement the solutions and then we monitor how's it going. If the answer is no, we go back and do another pre-consult and we come through again. And then if it works, we have a process check. Let's continuously improve our program. Now you'll notice that all the arrows are pointing in and out of everywhere here. At any stage in the game, we can revert to somewhere else. We manage the process. The process does not manage us. So it's a continuous back and forth, back and forth as we talk to each other and go. Here was a Goodrich's program. At the very beginning, we have got to have a commitment. We have to have knowledgeable people who want this for some reason or other and they know why. There's a strategy and the re roles and responsibilities are nailed down. Who is the key client? And that's going to be somebody in the line who needs this badly and his management or her management. And we have to have a value stream map that we've got that we can use. The next stage is let's find the bottlenecks in the stream. And this is called problem finding, fact finding, and problem definition. As we find the bottlenecks, we then are able to um, define them as how might we challenges 
and we have defined the problem. We all agree on it. We know what we're trying to do. After that, we start selecting the tools. Now, here's a whole bunch of tools. As we define the project, we decide which tool or tools are we going to are we going to need? What's most appropriate? Uh, one of them could be uh, the simplexity process itself. It could be Six Sigma, but we pick the right tool depending on what the problem actually is. Then we apply them. We uh, establish baselines. We know what we're looking for, analyze data. We apply the tools and plan changes, which leads us into implementing the changes. Let's do what it takes to get them implemented. Let's monitor, analyze. Did the problem get solved? Now, if the answer is no, watch that arrow all the way to the top where we define the problem again. Maybe we should look at it again. Uh, maybe we left something out and we come through again. Now, if the answer is yes, we um, move on and um, uh, say, great, we implement and we um, uh, implement our process check. How did it go? Uh, could we done it better? And we uh, continuously improve what we did over and over again. And this is the flow. Now, as a um, review, here it comes. The strategic flow is this. First, we did the upfront stuff. Now, we find the bottlenecks, define the problem. Now, we pick the tool and define the project. Now, we apply the tools. We implement. We look at how well we did. If we go back or go forward, but then we process check and see how we're doing, continuously improving our process. Here's the results at Goodrich. These are real. The completion rate went to 70% versus 30% after 30 days. A big, big jump in getting things done. If you look at the amount of effort put in, number of hours spent by number of people, number, it was reduced by 75% to get things done in terms of how much manpower was needed. Time to implement was cut in half versus standalone tools. And on a longer range basis, how well do they stay in place? Standalone tools had a way of dropping off and the benefits dropping off in terms of money, where the integrated tools were this, we kept, the base, kept the pace, if not a little bit better. Here's where our learnings were. The pre-consult is critical. Defines the problem. It's the first step to make sure we have the client ownership. The person who's leading the uh, project should not be the owner. That person is the process person who's serving the owner or the super owner getting the right people and picking the right tool or more than one tool. This is critical before we do anything. Independent project facilitation with a consistent process. There's our process. We move people through it and the person who is uh, using the process is independent of the actual work. The experts know. Now the facilitator may have a lot of knowledge too, but he makes it very clear if he ever steps in, but outside he's seen as the person who's just making the process work. Lots of group solving to eliminate roadblocks. The simplified process is critical. And again, the best opportunities are not the ones we kind of guess at. We have to make sure we got the right ones. And implementation is accelerated if we have our eye on the ball, our focus, what we're trying to achieve. And it's important to continuously improve our process itself. Here we go. Always begin with a pre-consult to clearly define the problem. The tool follows. And good teams are always working. Are we working on the right things? Are we solving the right problems? Before we jump in, are we working on the right problems before we jump? This goes back to the famous quote by Einstein. If I had an hour, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the problem and only five minutes needing the, for the solution. This is the key to the pre-consult. It's hard for a lot of people. Remember our, our uh, display here. So many of us are on the implementation side and the optimization side where the name of the game is problem definition. It's not natural for a lot of people to say, 
first I do problem definition. The more tendency is I got to hurry and implement something and I got a tool. Here's the pre-consult. The first three steps of the process, fuzzy situation, fact finding, problem definition, looking for problems and defining them. In the pre-consult, there are four roles and the, there are process roles and there are content roles. Now, the coach is someone who could be coaching. It could be the whole team coaching. The key is the facilitator. The facilitator is the person who is going to guide the process. The owner is the key content person. This is the person who needs something. He is in the line. He's a manager who needs help. And um, there might be more than one, but there might be a super owner as well. And then there are participants. The participants are invited to come on in and help. They might be partial, uh, partial owners. They might also increase ownership as time goes on. But it's vital to separate content from process responsibility. Uh, we want objective use of the process. We want to systematize the application. We want to let the participants be creative, help them with the process, and get lots of ideas. So who do we invite to our session? They're the participants. Who is the owner? Who owns this problem? And the, the person with the black belt should not be the owner. That person is a leader of the process. Here are the skills the process leader needs. First of all, he's a guide. He guides the team through the process. He stays out of content. He doesn't mix people out by putting his own views in. We got the experts in there. Let's help them uh, get there. This person is good at helping people get to consensus and move to execution more quickly. It's a people-centered process. Help teams generate new ideas without fear and put them out on the table. Promoting collaboration with people with lots of different perspectives from all over the organization. And um, uh, if you look further down, bridges the language and cultural gaps with teams. They all got their own ways of speaking. He bridges them together. Use simple language. He gets people confident that our process can help us take on a big challenge. It's okay, we can do it. Lots of transparency and respect for other people's points of view. And uh, high impact solutions. A lot of people shy away from high impact solutions because, wow, I don't think it could work. Uh, let's get away and do something more simple. We got it. We got a chance to do it. And finally, combines the analytical part with the creative part without any differentiation. They're seamless. Now, here's an example of a pre-consult uh, that we did to start the Jurovinsky uh, um, uh, work. At the very bottom, remember one of the key at the very start, a key was we've got to get high impact fresh ideas into our RT, uh, RTP processes, radiation therapy planning. If you ask why, there were two key ones. Number one, we need to evaluate our best fresh ideas for reducing wait times. How might we? Number three, how might we get our staff to buy into any proposed changes? What's stopping us? How might we define the best opportunities for wait time reduction? How might we get good practical ideas that's going to remain for a long time for good quality care? What's stopping us? How might we conduct good quality fact finding around the wait time issue? And how might we involve all of our groups in reducing wait times? Moving up, why? How might we implement high impact, fresh ideas into our RTP process? See number eight, why? This will help us, number nine, reduce the waiting time at each of the RTPs. What's stopping us? We haven't yet simplified the RTP process, uh, process chart. If we did, it would help us reduce waiting time. Why? Number 11, how might we cut down the wait time in the RTP process? What's stopping us? How might we, number 12, prepare more patients more quickly for treatment and that would lead to reducing the RTP planning process to two weeks or at least 90% of the time for, uh, uh, or less at least 90% of the time. And finally, why? How might we improve patient care? That's always at the top. And number 14, how might we meet Cancer Care Ontario's objectives. This is the governing body, and they've laid down what they're looking for. If we do all of this, we'll, both, we'll conquer both of those uh, challenges at the top. So that's an example of a 
free consult. Now, types of problems, two kinds. There's program problems. We know the, the problem. We've seen it before. We got a way to do it, and the facts are pretty clear. The other side is totally different. We've never seen it before. No single right answer. It's messy, and there's too much or too little data. And I think many organizations struggle with both, but certainly the one on the right-hand side needs help, and this is where simplexity thinking comes in. Now, what happens, because we're so used to programmed, is we will jump from one to eight, as you may recall. Remember the uh, Irish Spring story. A lot of us are so tuned to solutions, we will jump from, number one, having a problem, an opportunity, and into action, back and forth and back and forth, rather than taking our time to go one, two, three, through eight to understand better what we're doing. It might take a little more time, but it will pay big dividends. Now, the summary, conduct a pre-consult, select the tool and design the program, implement, monitor, uh, monitor and analyze the content, see how we're, well we're doing, and then take the time to make improvements to our process. Now remember, uh, our flexibility, efficiency, adaptability, Using simplexity drives all three. Even though a lot of the efforts these days are against efficiency, you start using that process, you're going to get innovative things you didn't expect. Um, and it'll drive all three of them. Um, one example was the Los Angeles Olympics uh, situation we had with the Frito-Lay company. They were coming up, and the Frito-Lay company was very worried about um, the mess, the traffic snarl that occurred during the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. Instead of uh, hiding in the sand, uh, we put a team together. The police chief, the constables, the um, traffic controllers, everybody got together and we began to work on how might we prevent ourselves from losing um, uh, money uh, and, and uh, sales during the, um, the, the forthcoming Olympics. We used the process carefully, one after another, one step after another, and created not only uh, increased efficiency, but a lot of brand new ways of doing uh, the store door delivery that were innovative ideas that were kept on forever after the, um, after the event that occurred. So innovation occurred. We call this collaborative innovation. You start problem solving together on one problem, new, better ideas start coming from all over. And uh, the increase was 10%, not a decrease of 10% uh, at that time, and it helped forever the store door delivery system. We need a structure. Teams need to be coached and trained. Uh, teams have to understand how do we fit in the organizational strategy. Where are we? We've got to make resources available. There's lots of opportunities, and we've got to make sure there's a varied toolkit. Process leaders need to be trained in the people-centered skills to facilitate teams. And we've got to have project teams that are not pulled off all the time onto another problem, another problem, another problem, short term, where they're allowed to focus because it's big time money that's involved and big time innovation. And very much clarify the relationship between owners of the project and the facilitators, leaders of the project, two separate things. Our, our way of looking at innovation strategy is a three-cornered one that works all the time. There has to be a compelling need, a business case for each project, uh, for everything we're doing, uh, every change project we're doing in the organization, no matter what it is. There has to be a structure. There has to be a structure by which this can be accomplished. You can't have people saying, well, I'll work on it once in a while. There's got to be a structure by which we're working toward that business need all the time. And then we need a change-making process. The simplexity process will do the trick where we say we've got a standard process we can revert to and we can get that business seed within the structure. Those three things are compelling needs over and over again in any walk of life if you're going to have innovation. Now, simplexity thinking, let's, let's review. Uh, it's a single integrated plan change process, not a bunch of tools and disciplines. It's a complete process. It will provide the capability to put these tools together into the plan change process, and new ones can come along, and they will fit in. Where does it fit? Where does it fit? And an important part is it's not just the process. It's the thinking skills, behaviors that will make it work. Deferring judgment, separating divergence from convergence, not jumping from one to eight, listening, respecting each other, understanding the facts carefully, and... Um, 
defining problems uh, and taking the time to uh, generate problems and not jumping to conclusions too quickly. But also, you can look at it simplexity thinking as a way of taking the entire enterprise, um, not just little fundamental changes in the plant or in the hospital, but a, a change process that can contribute to the strategic success of the organization. And uh, let's look at this. Most uh, CI projects are in the middle there, the organization, the enterprise value stream. We look at it, and we're trying to improve from the beginning to the end. The expanded one says, why not involve our suppliers and sub-suppliers uh, in our um, CI uh, system? Why not customers and end-use customers? Why not bring them in and expand continuous improvement beyond our borders uh, and um, uh, make it a much more powerful uh, process? And this is where innovation can come in uh, heavily. Um, one example I remember was um, there was a problem with um, potato chips seasoning falling off um, to, uh, and costing a lot of money during the process of uh, making the potato chips. And uh, rather than work on this problem themselves, uh, the um, manufacturing people said, why don't we uh, involve our suppliers in this thing? And uh, they began to work together and the suppliers said, uh, yeah, we can help you with that, and we could have helped you with that, but we're never sure if we're ever going to get your business or not, and it will require us investing in a new machine, which we'd be willing to do if we only knew we were going to get part of your business. And that had been holding them up for a long time, and when this came out, the organization said, listen, we will guarantee you so much, go ahead and do it, and the problem was solved. It never would have been solved if we had not involved the suppliers. Customers have got great ideas that can help, if we involve them and share with them and bring them into the process. In summary, we need a process of uh, complete change making and uh, it's not, it's more than tools, but we need to be very sharp with the process. It becomes a way of life. We've all got preferred styles and we need to integrate them together so that we, uh, we don't work in silos, we work together. The pre-consult is crucial. It establishes true ownership and much more than that. The business need, the structure, and the creative process. This has to be in front of us at all times, guiding our efforts. Process facilitation is critical. You could be an awfully good manager on some things and making up good stuff, but if you're not leading your team or the organization through a process, and involving them, you're only going to be half a manager. You've got to have both sides. Now, here is the bottom line. Effective change requires expanded thinking, more than tools, into a complete process. And the first part of the process is um, problem formulation. Now, uh, we've been working very, very hard for a long time on developing skills in people in this process. It's something that can drive anything. It's a different way of thinking. And we've been gaining uh, more and more knowledge about how to use uh, digital ways of spreading the news and our understandings to many, many more people, 7 billion people on, uh, uh, billion people on the planet. And if this is culminating in what we, which we call Simplexity University. And uh, we are launching this um, shortly. And in uh, fact, uh, Bob may tell you it may be already launched, but uh, everybody registering this webinar is going to get an email linking you to a sneak, uh, sneak peek at Simplexity University. This university is going to have um, as much, uh, going to keep on adding to it, all the knowledge we got, all the webinars we've done, um, all the, um, blogs we've done, all the um, examples we've done. We've had uh, uh, videos done of this example, that example. We've had um, a two-day session videotaped as to how's it done, how's the application such, how's the training done. Uh, there, be, there are many, many pieces of information we've accumulated uh, for many, many years, and they're going to be put into the uh, university so people can access it 
and um, uh, find what they need. They can interact back and forth. They can put their knowledge in on uh, things they've learned. And uh, uh, overall, it will be a, a, a place, a repository for the, all the knowledge we've got about applied creativity that we've uh, gathered. So we are hoping that uh, many of you will tune in and maybe we'll find that this is pretty interesting stuff and we will go a long way toward extending our reach to uh, many, many people. And of course, these webinars are part of that. How do, we, uh, how do we get our message across to many, many more people than we could possibly do by having a seminar here and a seminar there? And how do we build a community of practitioners and understanders so that we can all share together and get much smarter at things like continuous improvement much quicker and, um, and in much more depth. And uh, I'm going to now uh, turn this over uh, to Bob Thanks, to take us a further. Yeah, that's great. Okay, Bob. So just uh, I'm going to get into some uh, questions in a second, but um, this typical slide that we always have up, I want to highlight that our next webinar is going to be February 2nd, 2016, and it's called No More not my job, busting silos with complexity thinking. I think everybody, especially people working in large organizations, are familiar with the concept of silos. So uh, we're going to uh, dive in there, talk a little bit about how complexity thinking can remove all of those and bust those silos. Our next webinar, or our next workshop, certification workshop, level one and two, is scheduled January 13th to, through the 15th in Burlington. Yes, it will be cold. But uh, if the sun's shining, it never feels that cold because we, uh, we get lots of good sunshine. And uh, there's a link, www.bassar.com slash January Workshop. Or, you know, if you want to give us a ring or send us an email, we'll, you know, give some more information, we'll be happy to give that to you. So I'm going to switch it over to, we're really excited about Simplexity University. And, um, again, you'll be getting an email from me with a link. And uh, you can certainly respond to that email if you have any other questions. But we do encourage people to go check it out. There's some really cool stuff in there. And we're going to be adding to it all the time. A couple of questions that popped through. So um, here's one. How long do most of your projects typically take? And who, uh, who gets involved? OK. Uh, when we are working with a, a, a typical project, one of the things that we do uh, is when the the uh, leading team is decided, say they have about 16 or 20 really good solutions that uh, the teams have recommended to them. Well, you can't do 16 solutions, but you might be able to do three or four. Um, one of the criteria we invoke is that this solution has to be implemented, one of the four has to be implemented within uh, 60 days or two of them. We have to get some points up on the scoreboard. So that's one answer to the question. Uh, the other one is from start to finish, say the Juravinsky project, that might end up being a three-month project. It's major. It requires many, many people working many, many uh, times. No, nobody has to work a long time. But say we could put a, um, a problem-solving team together. They may only work for two hours. By the time we get them going, they can generate 50 ideas against that how might we in two hours. Well, then we have to collect the ideas, put them together with other ideas and uh, other teams and start scheduling the next workshop we're going to have with the uh, steering team to choose. Then the implementation again. So that might be a three-month project. Uh, uh, it could be very, very typical. Um, I think a lot of them uh, can be uh, even six-month projects if, they were, if they're major. But uh, they could be shorter as well. I mean, if you can find, uh, it all depends on that pre-consult, defining what the problem is. And it can be something that uh, could be scheduled for a team meeting. Uh, once we got the people together in a two-day workshop or a one-day workshop, where the solutions can come out in just that time. And then the implementation uh, can be very, very quick if you got the right people in the room. So it can be very, very fast depending on, again, we won't know until we do the pre-consult, we know what we're trying to do. So I hope that helps. It's always interesting to find out, but the key, again, is the ownership. If the ownership is real and folks want it done and they're looking for it, it will happen. It will happen uh, very, very quickly. And uh, people are really good. I mean, they're, they're in organizations because they want to be, and they're going to make it work if they get a chance to work with others, get, ex get inspired, and be... Uh, 
they get uh, kind of uh, really interested in, my gosh, I didn't think we could get that many good solutions in that short a period of time by just getting together and following a process, and then it can happen. Hope that helps, Bob. Um, yeah, great. Do you typically do power dot? This is what we call power dotting, doing the dots, which is telescoping on of the sub problems, or typically just do it for ideas. Oh, we do it all the way through. Uh, that's a great uh, question. We do it on uh, fact finding. Uh, the uh, and then if uh, it's the it's the telescoping, and what happens is uh, during at the very beginning, uh, it's done all the way through the process. Every time you converge, you do uh, the uh, the dots. It's a telescoping process where, if we're looking at the, um, let's look at the facts, uh, where we got the, uh, uh, the facts in front of us, or let's say we've got the process flow in front of us. Everybody in that room gets one or two dots. They go up. Now you've got a lot of dots. Now you see where they've come down to a smaller number now where people are um, picking, uh, they start clustering a little bit. Every one you go through, you say, who picked this one and why? We listen. It's, uh, we clarify. We talk. We start understanding better and better. And once we understand, then we say, okay, let's all agree on what the top one, two, three, or four are. And we do consensus talking and building, and we come up with three or four. When we get into problem definition, mapping, we do the same thing. The, the dots go up, and then we talk again. There is no voting. The last thing you ever want to do is vote on anything. That's winners and losers, and we are losing the strength of the knowledge of the people. And then we choose. When we get into uh, ideas, same thing. We got 50 ideas, put the dots up. All of a sudden, we're down to about nine. And then we talk about the nine, and we start clarifying. Under, oh, is that what you meant by that? I didn't know. And now new ideas often pop up. Well, gee, if we do it that way, we could also do that. And in in uh, the um, this is something that uh, we've got documented and published. When you do a honest to God diverging plus converging uh, converging uh, uh, portion, new ideas start popping up that were totally unexpected when people really understand. And then we can increase the number of ideas we got. We got two or three more ideas. Now we start picking the key, and we're down to three or four. Uh, let's get them down, the really important ones, and uh, the evaluation has to come in. And this is where the conceptualizers have got to step back a little bit and say, yeah, they're all good, but there are three or four that are really vital. And uh, then with the same thing with the steering committee, those 16 or 17 ideas that solve those four how might we's, up they go, 16 of them, the dots go up. What are the most important ones? Every single one. Who picked this and why? Who picked this and why? Listen, talk, discuss. New ideas start popping up. Okay, now we've got to really select the very top ones because we know you can't implement 16. Let's really talk together. What are the top three, four, or five? And again, we talk and talk and we have consensus. You have to have consensus in every step of the way. And you can get that consensus simply with a good facilitator who can help people bridge small gaps, agree on things, and use the words carefully. And suddenly we say, okay, that's it. We all, if you don't have that, it's a house of cards. The person who nods his head in fact-finding and doesn't really agree is not really committed. And now if we get the same thing going on in problem definition, we got two or three, no, nah, I'm just going to throw, you know, no, it's not going to work. This has to be consensus all the way, and you have to work hard at it. Otherwise, if there's not consensus, there's something wrong. There's something missing, and usually there's something somebody knows that somebody else doesn't know. So it's absolutely critical all the way through. It's not just an idea. Same thing with criteria. Uh, we helped the group come up with criteria, the steering committee. By what criteria are we going to judge these ideas? Let's get, let's get real. And if we want some that are done in 60 days, let it get it up there. And uh, let's really figure out what the criteria are and agree. And this is not fun and games. This is like real. And then we pick those. And then uh, all the way through with the action planning groups, we use the same technique again. But the consensus is absolutely vital. Hope that helps, Bob. Yep. Um, one question is, when you're picking tools, how do you kind of go about How do you know what tools or what tool is most appropriate? Any, well, the, uh, any insights there? 
Yeah, the, well, the problem definition will tell you that. Uh, if the problem definition, say, the, out of the problem, it says, you know, uh, there's too much variability in the um, ingredients we're getting from our suppliers. That would point toward uh, Six Sigma. Uh, Six Sigma uh, is a great way of reducing variation. That would be an example. Uh, if the uh, thing says uh, we need to fine tune um, a couple of our processes are still pretty good and we need to do it pretty quickly, um, we're not looking for anything big, uh, this might lead to a lean event uh, where we could focus quickly. Uh, if the problem is that uh, <laughs> we're such a mess around here, you know, uh, people don't know what's happening, coming and going, with stuff all over the place, it might be a five S's uh, kind of thing. Who knows? Uh, if it's something that says, you know, we, um, we've, been, uh, we've got a major problem uh, with this thing, we need some innovation here, and uh, maybe we should have a big look at this. The, uh, the, the challenge is how might we uh, cut down our wait times by a half? Wow, I think we might need uh, the, the entire creative problem solving process, things like that. So the key is the pre-consult, if you do a really good one, it's going to be everybody agreeing on, yep, yep, this one, this one. And um, the, um, one of the famous examples I've had in the past is, is this a simple um, uh, problem that we kind of know what we're trying to do? We just need to know how to do it. Or is this a kind of a fuzzy problem, a more complex problem where we've never seen it before? And we're going to need a group of people pretty darn smart who are going to be able to do fact finding and come up with uh, uh, some new ideas to handle it. And I could give you an example if we have time, but I, I'd rather, uh, uh, and, and Bob, it's the Gleam example, but I turn it back. A we'll couple more here. Yeah. One person uh, has written, um, he has a problem in his company. The process owner doesn't get involved in the problems. What can he do? Uh, to, to not get involved? I'm not yeah, sure. He's saying the process owner doesn't get involved in the problem, so what can he do? My well, guess is that um, you know there's the, there's something to do with the process that probably is not um, engaging the people enough or getting getting going. I, he has that's, to. That's well, the well, the main thing is this is a major uh, managerial skill to be a process leader, uh, and that is not doesn't come easy. That person has to learn the simplexity process. He or she has to get very very good at leading people through it. Uh, has to know how to stay out of content. He's the project manager. He manages that project, um, and he's helping the uh, the owner, the real owner, get results that the owner wants. The owner wants the results. If we don't have that, he's got to be very good at uh, making sure the owner knows he's the owner, and the owner is going to be second fiddle when it comes to the process and the process. But he's going to be first fiddle when it comes to uh, uh, the knowledge. And if that isn't in place. Uh, then you're going to have trouble. And that's one of the problems right now where we've got people who are caught between being both the owner and both the process leader. And that's something that it just is a, uh, it's a recipe for not so good results. And if a today's leader, CEO, anybody down the organization wants to st distinguish themselves as a real leader, you are able to um, lead other people through the process, not try to be an expert on everything. So how do you reconcile that role if both the process leader and the owner are stakeholders? Um, one well, person sort of heard, felt that the process leader seems to have bigger stakes, but how do you reconcile that role, especially if somebody who might be a process leader who is actually part of the team or inside that organization? One part how of it, is that, uh, well, that, that's one of the traditional uh, challenges for a process. A process leader needs to stay out, and he needs to say, look, I'm not going to get in. I'm going to let the uh, the team do it, and uh, and the owner has to help him do that. Stay out. But second of all, why not choose another process leader? Get somebody else who could be the process leader who's not involved. Uh, you can need more than one process leader in the organization. You say I'm going to be the owner this time. I'm going to be the owner, and I'm going to have someone else lead the process for me. And that is the that uh, it's easily done. If you've got more than one process leader, everybody should be a process leader in the organization, and um, of course. But um, and this is goes beyond continuous improvement. It goes beyond the entire management process. So find a way to be one or the other, 
and there's a, a two ways to do it. One is say I'm executing the um, I'm going to get out of the ownership. And by the way, if you do a good pre-consult, you never know you might turn out not to be the leader, the uh, the program leader that you thought, the content leader. But uh, that has to be handled. Great. Well, that's kind of all we have today. Um, I think uh, my experience has also been, you know, you get you'll get some people that are content experts who become you know, this next step, try to lead the, the process and can't really, you know, get out of that role of, and they, uh, they'll constantly inject kind of what they think and what they, um, what they may recommend as opposed to uh, just becoming uh, a, um, a process leader. And Bob, if I could say quickly, I mean, if you're really good, you can lead the process and tell the group, I'm in, I'm out. Okay, I've got something I want to say right now. I'm going back into content put it in, get back out. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's ideal. If you're that good is to simply tell the group, listen, I'm, I'm doing the process here. There's going to be times I might have something to interject and I'll let you know when that is. And I'll say, I'm going to change my role for a minute, get in there and then get out again. But the group has to know exactly which hat you're wearing. Am I a process leader or am I a, an owner? And you could go back and forth and that's okay, but you let them know and hopefully keep it down to, uh, a, a bare minimum, but as long as everybody knows, they're going to help you. If they know the process, they're going to help you. I got two quick ones, really quick. How do you get the owner of the issue to value taking time uh, for the process leader? In other words, how do you how do you make sure the owner really values the time of the yeah. process leader? And another question was around uh, when we did the healthcare work uh, around tools. Um, what uh, what are some of the appropriate tools to use when you reduce wait times in healthcare facilities? Well, on on the uh, on the healthcare facility, it was the the simplexity process uh, all the way through. Uh, the, that it was all the way through that we did that, and we were able to uh, handle this big big thing well. Now on the other one, I know we've used lean as well. Yeah, we've used lean. Lean has been a, lean is very common in healthcare uh, yeah, facilities. Yeah. yeah. And uh, simplexity fits very well with lean in healthcare. Oh, so, oh yeah, it's uh, a way to enter. Uh, uh, if you've got a good lean thing going, keep it going and use simplexity on top of it to make things go faster, quicker, um, and uh, define problems better, get people enjoying getting into uh, doing a balanced scorecard, not, not worrying about getting in and uh, doing it with fun. Uh, the other one, um, look, at if you don't have ownership from the line, you've got a losing proposition is what it boils down to. And this is where we get into the structure. The structure has to be such that, um, uh, everybody understands the ownership strategic. Why are we doing stuff? And you don't have an owner saying, well, you go do this for me. You cannot delegate very good um, uh, continuous improvement. The owner has to be part of it. And if you're not an owner, you're not a good manager. That's strictly it. And somehow it sometimes means saying no. It's saying unless I can get you in here, it is we're not going to be done. And you have to say to the guy, what problems strategically are we trying to solve that we need to take time to do this and if you can't identify there's a real reason for doing it. there's no business need then you, this is not going to work and that goes back to the structure we we're talking about we have to have, have people looking at this pro, uh, the CI program as a strategic tool to make major changes and implement uh, major changes to our strategic uh, the, the life of this organization it's not something we delegate we have managers who have it on their plate that my job is not just to make profits in the next quarter. My job is to make this company get stronger and stronger and better and better in the future. And that means change. I've got to be a change-making agent in this company. Otherwise, we're, we're, uh, we're, not, we're nowhere. We're going to be a short-term, uh, next 90 days kind of company that doesn't realize that the major reason for a manager to be a manager in the future is to make change. That's the biggest thing that person's got to do. Because anybody can write a t run a tight shift, but it takes a lot of skill in being able to orchestrate change and knowing that you've got to be the owner to make it happen, and the process is vital. Well, that's great. Um, I think we have, I've got one other question I'm going to respond to uh, through the webinar console, but I think from a recording standpoint, we're ready to leave the webinar, and we you know really want to thank everybody for tuning in. Hope everybody has a great holiday season. And um, look forward to seeing everybody in 2016.
and really look forward to people's feedback and comments on Simplexity University. That is really where we're going next, and we want to continue our online offerings. So, um, you know, we're giving you a free trial, but we really encourage people. Let us know what you think. If uh, we're missing something or you think uh, something, uh, you know, we could do some topics that you're interested in, let us know. We'll be happy to do that. But until then, have a great day, and thanks again for tuning in. Can I stop recording? Bob, can I stop recording? Yes.